Did y'all have fun last week or what? Yeah. Yeah? What was your favorite costume of the night? That's the real question. Your favorite. Bring and a friend, absolutely. Chicken, 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 chicken. Haven't been to KFC in years. When was the last time you went to KFC? Never. Never? Never? That's all right. Well, hey, tonight I thought I should sit down. How does that sound? Many of you guys' energy level might be a little bit low. So if I'm going to stand up and like preach at you, it might not be the right mood. So... Let's take some pressure off of our shoulders. Let's sit back. Let's relax. Let's take a deep breath. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. So uh, today we're talking about God and his promise. And so I asked the question up here. You'll see it. Has God forgotten his covenant with us? That's a good question. Today I'm going to try to answer that question. Um, Because at times it feels like as we live this life, sometimes we might think God forgets about us. Um, The short answer to that question is obviously no, God never forgets about you. But sometimes it doesn't feel that way, does it? Like when your favorite candidate doesn't quite get the electoral votes you want them to have, when you don't quite make the grade on your test, when maybe someone in your family gets COVID, you know there's a lot going on in 2020 Sometimes it doesn't always feel like God is there for us, but I promise you, He is. Tonight I'm going to share with you a story as we finish up the book of Micah, uh, discussing, although they would be punished because of their sin, God would still find a way to bring them back. Find a way to connect Him with them again, to live a life worth living. They might have to experience punishment for their sin, and because of their consequences, but yet God is still good. First, I'm going to lead with the story, and you're going to like the story, especially because most of you guys are from Texas, right? Yeah, if you're from Texas, go ahead and raise your hand. Wave a high, wave it proud, because we're proud Texans, absolutely. William, are you not from Texas? There we go, there's that hand, really high. We're proud people, and you know what we're really, really proud about? Everybody's going to like this. We're really proud about our brisket. Our brisket is the absolute best in the history of the United States. It just tastes phenomenal. And when you live in South Texas, you grow to love it even more. I don't know what it is about the the area of South Texas, but your level of Texas pride goes up exponentially. Bree moved from South Dakota. She didn't quite understand from the get-go, but over time, she has grown to love Texas, and it has its roots in South Texas. I don't know what it is, but when you drive to City Market Barbecue, when you put some of that nice goodness inside of your belly with a big red soda or my favorite, a a nice Coca-Cola out of the bottle, it's just special. It's just special. One time I went to Rudy's, which is one of my favorite barbecue joints. It's not the best. I'm not claiming that it is. Um, Compared to Texas barbecue standards in South Texas, it's good, but it's not great. But I like Rudy's because of the memories. I have so many memories in Rudy's, whether it be as a teenager, whether it be as an adult or on mission trips. I just love it. Um, It's gas station barbecue, but probably better gas station barbecue. And so I go there to get my brisket once. I ordered like a pound of brisket along with the sweet tea, because the Rudy's in uh, the New Braunfels area has the best sweet tea of all of them. And I go to the area where I go to fill up my sweet tea with my brisket in, on the little tray, and I set it down, and I start getting my sweet tea, and you know what I do? I drop my brisket all over the floor. Sad day, completely my fault. I don't know. I was in despair. I just was like, I just spent 15 bucks on this, and now it's on the floor. But I'm going to eat it because it's Rudy's. Okay, so I'm in the middle of my despair. I I had pickles spill all over the ground, too. So I leaned down to pick it up. I started putting it all back in the tray. And you could tell I was sad. And then the next thing you know, a lady from behind the counter comes out, helps me pick it up, and you know what she does? She gets me another pound of brisket for free. 
I didn't have to pay for it. And now it was completely my fault. I deserve to eat dirty brisket off the ground <laughs> that people have walked on. Maybe even stepped in gum. But you know what? This lady was so gracious that she offered me nice brisket so I could go to my seat and enjoy Rudy's. She didn't have to do that. Now, sometimes, Logan, if you walk into the sanctuary and there's one piece of pizza left and you grab it and you drop it, I can't get you another one. Sorry. But this lady did that for me. I never forgot that story, never forgot that moment. It's a small detail in life, absolutely. But sometimes we do stupid things, right? We are not exempt from doing stupid things. Sometimes it's just in our DNA. We just make mistakes. And... But that doesn't mean that our mistakes can't be overcome. And even more, that doesn't mean that our mistakes, that doesn't mean that we're bound to hold on to them for every day for the rest of our life. No, there's a thing that God offers called forgiveness. Maybe you've heard of it. He forgives people of their sins. Today, as we conclude our study on the book of Micah, which I hope you've enjoyed, by the way, it is eerily similar to what I believe our nation is going through. Now, let me throw a huge disclaimer here. I'm not here saying that our nation is Israel. I'm not saying that at all. The reality is Michael was written to a specific church at a specific time, and honestly, we are not it. Sometimes I, I, we have in America this little good guy persona that everything we do is the right thing to do. It's not always Okay? It's not always. We're not always the good guy. We're not always Captain America. We're not always uh, the superhero saving the day. Uh, sometimes we are, but we're not always. We are not the center of the story that we're reading today, but we can learn from the people that we're discussing today. We may think our hearts are on trial in the ballot box, but I promise you, we have way bigger issues than who wins or loses the election. There are way bigger issues out there that we must fight for. Results are important, sure, but what really matters is what's going on in here. What's this beating like? What's this beating for? What's going on in here, inside your heart? What is the condition of your heart? Do we have a righteous heart or are we bound to our sin? Do we create our own morality or do we follow God? Where is the condition of our heart? Where's the condition of our nation's heart? Where's the condition of our world's heart? If you look around and you look around hard enough, I think you're going to see a place that needs God, but we don't always understand our need for God. And so we continue to make our own choices, continue to go our own path, continue to uh, rewrite our own morality what we view as right and what is wrong. And we live this way, and then we wonder why we end up in trouble. We wonder why we end up in places that we were never designed to go to. We wonder why our nation, why our world is in such a sinful state. And my question is, did God push that on us, or did we choose that for ourselves? Did God forgive us covenant? For his believers? Or is it a path that we chose? I think you know the answer to that. In Micah chapter 7, we find Micah ending in a lament. Ending just saying, hey guys, we messed up. We failed. Our leaders were corrupt. Our civilizations weren't perfect. We chased after our own desires. And you know what that brought us? It brought us judgment by the Assyrian Empire. And here we are. We're in our despair. How do we overcome this? Is it all hopeless? Did God forget about us and his promises? Or are we just, or is he going to come save the day? Is he going to come rescue us again? When you lose, when you fall short, when you experience judgment, it might feel like God has forgotten about you. But tonight, know that God will never, ever forget about you. Even more, he's always there with you. He's always there pushing you to move forward. He's always there challenging you to grow closer to him instead of your favorite football team or school activity. We need to learn to follow him. In Micah 7, um, he looked at his nation 
And then he could find nobody to stand for God, even in his own closest family. Injustice abounded. People looked for their own self-interest. Leaders accepted bribes. And Micah found no security, even within those closest to him. Does that sound familiar? It's not the same nation. But my goodness, it feels eerily similar. Micah was willing to endure the persecution that would go on to happen because he knew that one day he would be vindicated. Now, Bree, that's a big fancy word. What does the word vindicated mean? Absolutely. Someone would come and prove that he was correct. Now, he has been preaching to to Jerusalem. He's been preaching to um, the colonies saying, hey, guys, if we don't change, if we don't overcome, Samaria, if you don't get your act together, we're going to experience judgment. Someone's going to come over and they're going to take over our empire because we're not living for the one true God. And he predicted this, and guess what? It would go on to pass. In moments like that, you might feel like despair. You might feel like all hope is lost. You might feel like giving up. But yet, God did not forget about his people. In Micah 7, 8 through 9, uh, we find um, Israel being personified in this chapter as an individual sitting alone in his defeat. But God's love showed up. And this is what the author says today. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him. I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. And I will see his righteousness. You know, when you're ever defeated, and at times we lose, I tell my daughter that from time to time, although we want to win, although sometimes we want to be the first person across that finish line, although we want to hit the game-winning home run, although we want to be first chair, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we lose. It's a fact of life. Uh, I've lost. I've lost uh, important games I can remember back in high school, uh, we were four rounds deep into the playoffs, and we were playing in Texas Stadium, uh, where the old Cowboys used to play. You know, Troy Aikman, Emma Smith, Michael Irvin, Deion Sanders. I really wanted to win in that stadium. Our team needed to win in that stadium, and guess what happened? We got beat by a better team. Sometimes we lose in life, but yet we don't have to remain in that despair. The reason uh, why Israel was was in despair in this moment was because of their own choice. They chose sin over God. Their leaders chose bribe and money and the pursuit to, to uh, have power over caring for the people that are less fortunate, caring for the poor. They chose that path. And guess what happened? By them choosing that path, it took them to a place where they never wanted to go. They lost. They were defeated. But yet, even in defeat, there is hope. You know, in football, there's always another game to play. Even if you lose the Super Bowl, guess what? The next season's coming, about, coming around the corner. High school comes to an end. Maybe you didn't make the grade you wanted. Maybe you did. Guess what? College is right around the corner. When you make it into your job, maybe you get that promotion. Maybe you don't. But guess what? You're going to wake up tomorrow, hopefully, prayerfully, if God wills it. And guess what? You got another day to live. In this life, there are always going to be opportunities where we can uh, overcome. Defeat does not have to hold us back from the places God is calling us to go. But sometimes that defeat is thrown upon our shoulders because of our own choice. If you go into life and you create a lot of turnovers for yourself, which in football, turnovers are not a good thing, and basketball turnovers are not a good thing, it's going to make it harder on yourself. When we choose a negative path, it's going to make us harder on ourselves. But yet, God is still faithful. So Micah is saying, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, and I have, 
My city has sinned. We have not lived up to our covenant relationship with God. We have not uh, followed our path the way we were supposed to do. God honored us, but we didn't honor him. Although that that happened, God will not forget about us. God will restore us, restore us to the place he has called us to, to go. Although we are in defeat, God's people would not remain in defeat forever. Why? Because God loves his people, God is faithful to his people, and God will see his people through. Their sin caused defeat, but the Lord will not leave his people in their defeat forever. And that's why Micah 7, 18 through 20 is so important. This is the reason why. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our in iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob, and you will show love to Abraham as you pledge on oath to our ancestors in the days long ago. What's Micah saying? He's saying, God will come. God will rescue us for two reasons. You ready for those two reasons? First one, God's character. God's character. Did you know that God is a God of character? He stands for righteousness. He stands for truth. And you know what? Even though his creation is sinful, although we sometimes grab the apple from the tree we're not supposed to grab, you know what? God still loves us. Now, he doesn't like what we do sometimes. He doesn't like our sin. He doesn't like the times where we choose defeat in unrighteousness over him. But guess what? His love remains. So much so that he's willing to forgive sin, even though we, we do not deserve that. God will pardon us, pardon our rebellion, because he loves us. God's character shows us that he loves us. And then second, another reason why God will come to restore his people, because he promised it. He promised that he would. Is God a God of promises? Yes. Yes, he is. God keeps his covenants and commands. He would not forget his covenant made with Abraham. And honestly, he would even go on to promise Christ. He understood the covenant he made with Abraham in the days of old. He understood that he told Abraham that his descendants would be numerous among the stars, that, that his, his uh, lifeline would be a blessing to the nations. He understood all that. And guess what? He did not quit even when Israel rebelled. He remained even when Israel chose a different path. He remained and sometimes had to bring about judgment. But he loved his people. God's ultimate gift would be from Bethlehem, which is actually predicted in Micah chapter 5. Let me read that to you. Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, I can't pronounce that next word, so I'm going to give it a shot. Eraphathath. Did I say that right? Sure, we'll go with it. Though you were small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, who whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Does that remind you of anybody? Someone from Bethlehem, maybe raise your hand real quick if you know the answer. Anybody? Someone from Bethlehem that's of great value? Yeah, that, that could be it. Yeah, Samuel? Jesus, absolutely, you got it. Absolutely. He prophesied that Christ would come. So how can you have hope when you are being dismantled, when your civilization is being torn down as we know it? You understand that the Messiah is coming. And although you might experience despair now because of your choices, Israel, you will not be held down forever. God will come to you. God will give you the Messiah, and he will pardon you from your sins. He will throw those into the sea. He will trample on your sins. And he will take on the punishment that we deserved. Powerful. So what can we learn from today's lesson? 
Well, first, before I give the first point, let's look back about what's fully going on in the book of Micah. The leaders are corrupt. They are making bad choices. They are um, overtaking the poor. They are treating them very poorly and not giving them an opportunity to move forward. They're taking bribes. The rest of the people, the ordinary citizens, citizens, they are all about their own self-interest, caring about what they want more than whatever, what God wants. And so judgment is coming. So what can we learn knowing all that? You cannot legislate morality. Dustin, where in the world does that point come from with everything you just read? Good question. Uh, there's a reason why I wanted to add that point today. Not necessarily because it was like word for word in the scripture. I brought it up because a lot of people think that the political system that you're a part of can determine whether you're right or you're wrong. We think we can create enough laws to make people moral. Okay? Uh, when you look at the leadership going on in Micah's day, uh, they're doing everything but that. Okay? Morality. Whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, guess what? The laws you create, it can't make me choose what's right. It's not up to you. It's up to my heart. Only my heart can, can move forward with what's right and what's wrong. But even more, I can't create what's right or what's wrong on my own. I can't just make this stuff up as we go. No, the reality is there is a path already set out for us. There are scientific laws already put in place. That means that there was an intelligent creator who designed this world, who designed what's right and what's wrong, who designed a world that would spin correctly on its axis and then rotate around the sun. There's a thing called gravity that holds civilization to this world. Can't just make that stuff up. It's already created. It's already established. A leader can't do that for me. It's already been done. And it's up to me to follow that. Israel found themselves in ruins because of their sin and the sin of their leaders. But yet, God still loved his people. And he still does today. But our sin, we need to know this, our sin does lead to judgment. The reason why Assyria would go on to overtake Israel in this moment was because they were guilty of sin. They were guilty of disobeying God. They were guilty of choosing their own path instead of the path of God. And God is the creator of morality. Governments and kingdom can try to make laws to create right and wrong, but ultimately holiness depends on God. On God. Ultimately, righteousness depends on God. He's the only one who can create that. By practicing our own form of morality, guess what? We're going to run into judgment for our actions. We, we know, and I know, that our nation is not Israel. And I don't claim it to be. But I know that a leader or a politician will not save me from my own judgment. I know that my parents cannot save me for the choices that I make. No, I have to answer for my own actions. And like you, you must answer for your own actions. And it's something that we need to be aware of. They have their own sin to deal with. Our leaders, our politicians, they have their own sin to deal with. Much less them trying to deal with my sin. It's my responsibility to deal with my sin. It's your responsibility to deal with your sin. How can we say to someone else, hey, take that plank out of your eye when we have this massive plank sticking out of our own eye? You know, we got to keep our own house from burning to the ground, okay? And while you are at it, focus on things that are important. Focus on building that relationship with Christ. Focus on your relationship with Him. And let me take it a step further. The more you pursue after Christ, you know, I, I know you're going to hear people from a pulpit teaching you what's right and wrong, and there's a good place for that. We do need to know the difference between right and wrong. That's how we choose to do what's right. But yet, if your relationship with God is going to last, 
It's more than a right and wrong to-do list. It's got to be a relationship. You must care about him and what he desires out of your life. And then you must do whatever you can to please him. That's how we maintain Christianity. That is how we can maintain morality. That is how we can become righteous. Not because of ourselves or our own good deeds or our own thoughts or opinions. We can become righteous the closer we move to Christ. The closer we can build our relationship with him. That's where it starts. If you don't like the way our nation is, well, do me a favor. Uh, Build your relationship up with God. If you don't like what your neighbor does, do me a favor. Grow so strong spiritually that every time you walk by, they question whether the life they are living is correct or not. You fall in love with God. But ultimately, that's all that matters in this world. Your relationship with God. Nations rise, nations fall. But you know what remains constant? God's love for his humanity. God's love for his people. God's love for you. God's love for me. So the government cannot, more, cannot legislate my own morality. That's already said by God. It's my responsibility to chase after God. Which brings me to my second point tonight. Micah promised a Messiah in Bethlehem. And today, that Savior saves us from our own ruin. You know what? If we're going to be real honest in our life, we deserve everything that Israel went through. Because guess what? We make similar choices to that of Israel. I'm not saying that you're corrupt, but I am saying that you probably wrestle with sin. I think it would be fair to say that everyone in this room is tempted and they wrestle with sin of some capacity. Someone makes you mad, it's easy to um, not necessarily hate them, but have a, dis- uh, a pretty severe dislike for someone. It's easy to call someone a bad name when they upset you. It's easy to, to look at something that you're not supposed to be looking at, to dwell on things, to, to create your own stress, your own anxiety. It's easy to, to disobey your parents. It's easy to covet your neighbor's possessions. It's easy, uh, not necessarily to murder, but to have hate in your own heart towards someone else. It's easy. You see that in the church. You see that in society. It's very common. Knowing that, when knowing that sin leads to ruin, man, we, we deserved exactly what Israel went through. But yet something happened. Christ did come to this world, didn't he? He did die on the cross. Even though he was perfect and sinless, he could have snapped his fingers and the angels could have pulled him off the cross and he could have walked away just fine. But yet, he allowed himself, he allowed his body to be broken to take on the punishment that we deserved. That's grace. That's God fulfilling his promise. That's God renewing his covenant with us. Did God forget about his promises? Has God forgotten his covenant? The answer to that question is no. And that's fulfilled when Christ came into this world, fully human, fully God. He died on the cross. He comes back to life from the grave. Man, that's God. That's God showing that he loves you, showing that he cares. That's God saying, hey, I don't, I don't care whether your United States of America goes Democrat or Republican. I love you regardless. I don't care whether the nations are, are run by a dictator or if they're run by a, a great person. I love my people of all shapes and sizes, of all colors and ethnicities. I love them so much so that I sent my one and only son to show that he can fulfill the law, but not only that, to take on the punishment that the world deserved, to take on the judgment that the world deserved. The reality is God has not left his people. He sent Jesus into the world to pay the penalty, the penalty of our sin. And if we follow him, guess what? Then we are made righteous. The government can't do it for us. Only God can make us righteous. God has shown compassion on all of his people. And he would keep his promises. If God was willing to keep his promises to mankind, 
If God is willing to keep his promises to Micah, I promise you this, he will keep his promises for you today. He has not forgotten about you. The reality is he knows exactly where you are. And one day he is coming to rapture the church. One day he is coming to uh, establish peace on this earth. But until then, we have a job to do. To love God. To grow in our righteousness, not based upon our own choices, but based upon how close we can get to him because we know that our righteousness is filthy rags. He's the only one who can come into our life, make us whole, make us righteous. God loves you too much to allow you to remain in your own form of morality. God sees you in your sin, and he loves you too much to let you stay there. He loves you too much to let you stay there. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to peace, and that is God's way. Always remember that. Micah, he understood something. Although his people were sinful, although they would experience their own judgment, guess what? God would renew his covenant with them. God's promises would remain. God would forgive them of their sins. And guess what? He would go on to do it. But something that we can be left with today, God loves us and he sees us in our sin. He understands that we make mistakes. He doesn't want us to. He wants us to choose better. But at times we do make mistakes and God is willing to forgive us from our mistakes. Our sin does deserve judgment. Absolutely. No questions asked. The more we sin, the more we push away from God, we're in danger of judgment. But guess what? If we turn to God, God will forgive us. But he will not let us remain the same. Our sin deserves judgment and despair. And that may go on to happen, but God loves us too much to leave us there. In our sinful moments, because of Christ, God picks us up and he cleans us off. God dusts us off and says, you're going to be okay if we go to God. We may deserve a broken state, but yet God loves us too much to let us stay there. God sees us in our despair and he says, hey, you will rise again. You will rise again. Let me say this. God's character shows us forgiveness. And his devotion to his covenant with mankind ensures us that he will not leave us in our sinful and broken state. Simple fact is, God will heal our heart. God can heal our land if we return to him, if we go back to him. A president can't do it for you. Uh, uh, A leader can't do it for you. A a government official can't do that for you. Uh, Pastors can't do that for you. None of us can. All we can do is point you to the way. And honestly, following God, this is the way for you Star Wars fans out there. God, heal our hearts and heal our land. As I was studying today, I found this quote in my Encountering the Old Testament book that I had in college written by Arnold and Bayer. It says this, Evil may surround us, And we wonder why God allows it to continue. And such times our hope must lie in the God who can cast our sins into the depths of the sea. We can trust him to work all things together for the good of his children. My question is, are we his children today? And I trust that most of you are. Y'all are all good church-going folks. Y'all are here every Sunday and every Wednesday. But let me ask this question. Do we choose our own morality or do we choose God? Do we make this path up on our own or do we pursue God? Do we pursue our own self-interest or do we pursue God? Where are we at? Where do you find yourself tonight? Yes, I know today wasn't the funniest message. It wasn't me standing up yelling at the top of my lungs. But I don't think tonight was a place for that. I see the fatigue in your eyes. I see your energy levels. Sometimes we just need to be talked to. Talked to in a civil voice. A voice a voice of reason. Not that I'm necessarily the voice of reason. But the scripture is. The scripture shows us that sin deserves judgment. But God loves us too much for us to remain in our defeat. 
How cool is that? You're not going to find that in Hollywood. You're not going to find that in the leader. You only find that in God. Let me pray over you. God, we love you. We're thankful. We're thankful for this moment. This is a moment of opportunity as we move forward um, into tomorrow, into an uncharted future. God, I ask that you be with us. God, I ask that you be with us. God, if we feel a sense of defeat right now, don't let us. Because the reality is you're still on the throne and, and you pick leadership and, and you are right there with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. That's what your word teaches us. But we do need you in this moment. So lift us up. Encourage us. Let us pursue righteousness. Let us pursue you. God, if we understand that our own personal choices affects things. Not only does it affect our life, but it affects people. People all around us. Help us. Help us to pursue you. Because ultimately, you're what matters in this life. A vote counts, but your eternal life. Got to draw past that may hurt in the moment, but yet you, you've overcome the grave. You've overcome darkness. God, this world may be in a dark state right now, but yet your people will rise again. That's what Micah teaches us. Yes, our sin requires consequences, but yet if we come to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness. You will take our sin. You will throw it as far as the east is from the west. I still can't com comprehend. I still can't wrap my mind around that. But that's what you do. So God, I come to you today in a form of repentance. Saying, God, I'm sorry for our sin. God, I'm sorry for our own morality. I'm sorry for making the choices the way we do sometimes. The reality is I know we need you. If we have you in our life, guess what's going to happen? Our relationships with one another will improve. The way we care for our African-American brothers and sisters, it'll get better if we love you. The way we treat a Democrat or a Republican, it will get better if we love you. The way we treat people in the womb, it will get better if we have a relationship with you. The way we treat people in the LGBT movement, it will improve if we have a relationship with you. The reality is we cannot legislate our own morality. God, you are morality. You are righteousness. And I pray that we pursue you. You're what we need in this hour. You're what we need at this time. As we go into our school or into our work environments tomorrow, I pray that you encourage us. Our sin may feel like we are in defeat, but God, you will help your people rise again. We will rise again if we pursue you instead of our own self-interest. God, let us not repeat the same mistakes of Israel. Let us grow and be better because of it. Let us learn from the past. And let's never repeat it. Now, students, maybe some of you in here today, maybe you're struggling with sin. And I know we've talked about this a lot lately, but that's Micah. That's what he talks about. The sin of the leaders, the sin of the people, and the incoming judgment. That's the book of Micah. But he offers hope. He says, God, but God, we're in our despair, but God will see us through. God is sending Jesus into the world through Bethlehem. And he's going to take on the punishment of the world. He is going to receive your sin on that cross. Take on that punishment. Take on that judgment to create a new covenant so that you can connect with God. So that you can go to God and your sins can be forgiven. 
Today, church, today, you students, your sins can be forgiven. I know you have a relationship with God already, but maybe you have sin you're struggling with. Today, your sins can be forgiven because of who God is. If that's you, if you're struggling with sin, I just ask, be brave. If that's you, just raise your hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Is there anyone else saying, Dustin, that's me. I have sin in my life. Thank you, I see that hand. Is there anyone else saying, I'm struggling here. I'm struggling here, and I need God. Is there anyone else, anyone else at all? Students, if y'all could, could y'all repeat this prayer after me? Say, dear Jesus, you see where I am right now. You see my struggle right now. God, help me. Forgive me of my sin. Something I can't take away on my own. But you offer forgiveness. You're the Lord of my life. Help me to follow you. The author and perfecter of my faith. You're my God. And I want to be like you. So help me grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for letting me just talk to you tonight. I think tonight was a a good conversation. Jesus has overcome sin so that you can too. He did that so that you could be free, so that you could pursue his righteousness, so that you could be made whole. That's what we need in 2020 and as we move forward.